Democrats strategizing their next move after Robert Mueller's testimony. While the political and legal fallout is still unclear, Mueller did manage to remind us of a few very key points. Number one, that Russia interfered with our election in 2016, and they are determined to do it again next year. Number two, that this investigation resulted in indictments, convictions, and guilty pleas from nearly three dozen people, including the president's former lawyer, Michael Cohen, his former campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, and his former national security advisor, Michael Flynn. In fact, a jury convicted one of Flynn's former business partners just this week weak on charges that he illegally acted as a Turkish agent. But despite all of this, Speaker Pelosi did not seem to change her mind on impeachment. Take a listen. My position has always been uh, that whatever decision we made in that regard would have to be done with our strongest possible hand, and we still have some outstanding matters in the courts. It's about the Congress, the Constitution, and the courts. And we are fighting the president on, uh, in the courts. If we have a case for impeachment, that's the place we will have to go. Let's dig into all of this. Eli Stokels, White House reporter for the LA Times, Cynthia Oxney, former federal prosecutor, Claire McCaskill, former Democratic senator from the state of Missouri, also a former prosecutor, Elise Jordan, former aide to the George W. Bush White House and Time Magazine contributor, and Kurt Bardella, former spokesperson for the House Oversight Committee and NBC News Think contributor. Senator, I must turn to you first. It is the day after. What's the next move for Democrats? Well, I think what Nancy Pelosi is trying to convey, which is very important, is there's still evidence they don't have. The White House is stonewalling. I think they really need to turn up the heat and get these cases into court. The contempt of the witnesses that would bring Don McGahn in front of them, uh, you know, and that's the argument some are making for opening an impeachment inquiry because it strengthens their hand legally to get around executive privilege. So, in other words, the courts would be more likely to give them all the information they're seeking if it was under the rubric of an impeachment inquiry as opposed to just committee work. So what do you think they should do? Well, it, maybe they should open the inquiry f and make it clear that's why they're doing it, so that they can get all the information they need and, and then make a decision about going forward. Um, but I don't think what happened yesterday strengthened their hand in terms of public sentiment. As much as he was good about not being biased and being cautious and careful. No one could watch those hearings and think he was out to get anybody. Uh, it, it, it still was not the kind of emotional day that would have probably moved a lot of public opinion on the subject of impeachment. To that point, uh, Kurt, the White House, of course, is saying it was disastrous uh, for Democrats. And as the senator points out, we're not sure that public sentiment shifts. But you put out a piece saying, you know what? I disagree. Yesterday may have been stronger than people realize. Well, again, I think we have to realize something. Most <coughs> of the people in this country, they didn't sit there all day on their television and watch all the hearings wall to wall, hours and hours and hours of it. Wait, most that's people, what people do every day on MSNBC. People, Come on well, now. Shockingly here in New York and in D.C., but most people, they're going to digest this through 10 to 20 second sound bites, key exchanges. Their perception of that hearing will be very much like what we saw last night where Chris Hayes and Rachel Maddow ran these montages of what were the big moments. And what they saw, what people who digested the hearing that way saw, was more Mueller say he couldn't exonerate Trump from obstruction of justice. He said that right now, at this second, Russia is trying to interfere and meddle in our election. They saw the interaction where he said that the president's answers were not truthful. When you see it that way, your perception of the hearing is very, very different than those of us who watched it literally wall to wall. And so I think because of that, because of the way people really consume information in this day and age of Twitter and social media and seeing viral moments, I think that they might be seeing it differently than Except, we did. Except, of course, the people who are seeing it are in their own echo chambers and are, have any of those people changed their tune. I think about that woman who went to Justin Amash's mm -hmm. uh, town hall a few weeks ago who said, what do you mean the president wasn't totally exonerated? What do you mean there was anything negative in the report? So, yes, the people who watched Rachel Maddow and Chris Hayes saw exactly what you're talking about, but I'm pretty sure they had their opinion set. 
Well, I, but I think that's true for everybody at this point. I mean, let's be honest. No matter what Mueller said or did yesterday, people who watch Fox News weren't going to wake up and go, you know what? He changed my mind on Donald Trump. We have seen that those people are so far gone now that they would literally follow Donald Trump off a cliff if he told them to do so. So if Democrats in the House were hoping that this would change anyone's mind, they had the complete well, wrong mindset wait, going to this wait, hearing. Wait, there's a whole bunch of folks in the middle here. Yeah. There are only half of this country identifies with the party. Only half, 25% about saying they're Democrats, 25% say they're Republicans. 50% call themselves independents. Mm -hmm. That's where this election will be won or lost. That's what they were trying to do yesterday, was try to hit that group of people. And you're right, they didn't watch it wall to wall. But they also didn't see a report come to life. They didn't really get from what they're seeing on the news, the damning moment of right. this presidency that the Democrats hoped for. That doesn't mean it was a failure, it wasn't. Especially the afternoon hearing I thought was really powerful. But I think we sometimes forget, and frankly some of our people running for president forget, that the way back to sanity, the way to remove the chaos from the White House is through that 50% of the people in this country that refuse to identify with a well, party and I right agree, now. I agree with you that there is that big population, but I think that, if anything, it makes the case why Democrats need to actually have impeachment hearings so that they can educate the American people about what's really happening and lay it all out for them for them to follow. Elise Jordan, well, how did Republicans, and I don't mean hardcore Trumpers, but I mean your GOP, how did they see this? I think it was the beginning of a small puncture at a bare minimum. Mm -hmm. You open up major news papers and the headline is Mueller says Trump was not exonerated. Mueller says that he can't say that there was no collusion. <clears throat> so while it's the very beginning of the process, look at how what the slow build that was necessary for Nixon to finally end up resigning from office. This isn't going to just magically happen overnight. And I think part of the problem has been with the Democratic comm strategy has mm -hmm. been setting expectations that there's going to be some slam dunk, that there's going to be some moment yeah. where Donald Trump is just going to to be proven definitively once and for all to be a liar and to have done X, Y, and Z. And it's not going to happen that way. It's going to be a slow build of public opinion galvanizing in there in finally the forces against Donald Trump. And it's this was so important to exercise yesterday. And I'll just say an exercise because really at the end of the day, that's all it was. It wasn't some com compelling emotive testimony that everyone's going to talk about for the next century. It was important because it started to chip away at the lie. And you have Donald Trump, his strategy is just to repeat, 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 and lie, lie, lie. And it started to chip away. It might not have been emotional, but Robert Mueller said that the president could be charged after he leaves office. Right? Chris Matthews put it last night. Just think about this. He could serve another term or he could potentially serve time in prison. Robert Mueller might not have said that emotionally. He might not have been channeling Robert De Niro, but that is a powerful sentiment. Eli, I want to share what the president said after these hearings. We had a very good day today, the Republican Party, our country. There was no defense of what Robert Mueller was trying to defend. But what he showed more than anything else is that this whole thing has been three years of embarrassment and waste of time for our country. And you know what? The Democrats thought they could win an election like this. I think they hurt themselves very badly for 2020. Three years and 30 plus indictments. How do you see this, Eli? Well, the president was reacting as if he were a pundit on a cable news show yesterday, saying that Mueller's performance was bad, that Democrats hurt themselves politically. There was no attempt, and there has never been any attempt by the president, his lawyers, the White House staff, campaign folks, to grapple with the actual substance of Robert Mueller's uh, report findings, the fact that the president could not be exonerated on the subject of obstruction of justice, the fact that people close to him uh, were solicitous or accepting of Russian help during the campaign. And, and so they don't want to deal with the substance of that or the fact that Russia, as Mueller sounded the alarm, continues to interfere. There's nothing being done about that. The president has always looked at this solely through a political lens, through a media lens, a public opinion lens. And he has, from the beginning, responded to what is effectively a legal situation for him. He's responded in a political way, trying to, to smear Mueller, not cooperate, dismiss the entire thing, and to bring the American public along with him. Uh, and to the extent that, that Nancy Pelosi is reluctant 
to begin impeachment proceedings because she knows the Republicans in the Senate uh, aren't going to move the ball. Uh, Trump has been somewhat successful with that approach, even though it is plainly obvious uh, that he has no answer uh, to the obvious facts that, that Mueller presented to the country yesterday. Cynthia, Nancy Pelosi said she wants to fight or Democrats want to fight with their strongest hand possible. She said they are fighting this White House in court. Uh, that's obviously them trying to enforce Don McGahn uh, adhering to this subpoena and sitting down and speaking to Congress. Do we think that's actually going to happen? Because they're all about to go on vacay for five weeks. They're all about to go on vacay. He ha he refused to come two months ago and so far, you know, basically crickets. Hope Hicks lied to them and they gave her several weeks to come back. Uh, the problem is you can't just keep waiting for the next thing to happen that's going to solve all your problems. Oh, you know, first it was going to be uh, uh, Stone is going to flip, Manafort is flip, listen to Gates. You know, every, every, there's always a solution for them that doesn't include them making a decision. They're always kicking the can down the road. And that at some point they just have to make a decision. That's their job to make a decision about whether or not they're going to go forward. You know, the case isn't going to get any better. Don McGahn, now after this hearing uh, and the other tactics that the president has used, Don McGahn is not going to come willingly. They can pressure him in the court and then it's going to go up on appeal. It's going to take a long time. And then he's going to be, you think, you, you think uh, uh, Mueller was a, a reluctant witness. Wait till Don McGahn gets on the stand. So it, the case isn't getting any better. My position is they just need to make up their mind and decide to go forward and stop kicking the can down the road. So, Senator, could that be Nancy Pelosi's strategy? To that exact point, if Robert Mueller wasn't an enthusiastic witness, just wait until you get Don McGahn and Hope Hicks. Is the right move for Democrats to defeat the president in the next election? Well, I think that's certainly what Nancy Pelosi believes. Mm. I think she believes the strongest hand for this presidency is to defeat it next November. And she sees that the way the impeachment would work is ultimately he would not be impeached. So what have we gained other than distracting people from high prescription drug prices, the failure of this president on trade, the failure of this president on the border, the failure of this president to keep his promises and on everything he promised from infrastructure to building a wall. We are talking just about impeachment from now until next November or from now until next spring instead of the stuff that he's really vulnerable on. And she thinks the cake is baked as it relates to public opinion. Now, I'm, I'm trying to sh channel her here. I do think that if you're going to get McGahn in front of the committee, you need all the documents in order to cross-examine him, because he is not going to be a narrative witness. This is going to be a little bit like Mueller. So it, it, I do think there is some legitimacy to the argument. We need to get the courts for nothing else than for precedent, mm -hmm. that you can't have a yep. White House stonewall Congress like this. They're refusing to give them anything. That court battle needs to be waged and won. Mm -hmm. And then I think it's appropriate for them to look at what they've got and then make that decision. Protecting our elections should be something every member of Congress and every American should care about. Yesterday, Robert Mueller reminded us that in the first paragraph of the report, he writes, there were sweeping and systematic, there were sweeping and systematic Russian interference. And he was asked about it yesterday. In your investigation, did you think that this was a single attempt by the Russians to get involved in our election, or did you find evidence to suggest they'll try to do this again? No, oh, it wasn't a single attempt. Uh, they're doing it as we sit here. And they expect to do it uh, 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 during the, the next campaign. I, I hope this is not the, nor the uh, new normal, but I fear it is. But I fear it is. He said it's happening right now. Will Hurd asked him the question. Will Hurd is a Republican. Yet a few hours later, the same day, Senate Republicans blocked not one, but two election security bills. That seems extraordinary. Well, uh, how is this not the most important thing that came out of yesterday's hearing? I think it is. I mean, our democracy is literally under threat, under siege, under attack. And one of the two major political parties in this country doesn't want to do anything about that. Why? Because it benefits them. And I think it does illustrate a little bit the danger of waiting until the next election to deal with a crisis we're having right now. Because we know now. But the next, that election, next election is now. But this next election may not be fought fairly. 
it may be undermined by foreign interference, aided and abetted by the president of the United States, who welcomes that foreign interference, who encourages it, who says, if anyone gives me anything that could be damaging on my opponent, no matter where it came from, Russia, China, North Korea, he's going to read it rather than turn it over to the FBI. And so this is why I think impeachment hearings at least need to start happening, because we don't know for sure that the next election is going to be a fair one. Why would Republicans block these two bills yesterday? They are doing Donald Trump's bidding. They are falling in line and they're continuing the narrative of, oh, the Russians really didn't do anything to help Donald Trump win in 2016, which is his Achilles heel. And it was it's so symbolic almost for Republicans to oppose this, because in their heart of hearts, they know that the integrity of our elections needs to be protected. It's a tough vote to defend after the fact if another incident happens and then you have to go home to your constituents and be like, well, I just didn't, you know, federalism. I was really trying to, you know, keep control with the states. I just didn't want the federal government interfering. That's a tough vote to defend. But for now, they would rather do that than be in Donald Trump's crosshairs. Well, let's be clear here. Mitch McConnell yesterday afternoon, in his own way, he called Putin on the phone and he said, I love you so much. Come on in. Come on in. The water's fine. We welcome you to come to the Amer America and r try to rig our elections. That's what Mitch McConnell did yesterday. And it's on Mitch McConnell. And th these Senate elections, I think he is making a huge, he very rarely makes a miscalculation politically. I think this could be one for him because the notion that right on the heels, of the same day, the same day, saying they are here, they're trying to go after it. And everybody in America knows who they were trying to help. And everybody knows that Putin is Trump's BFF. So now it's the three of them. And, you know, we have to argue who does Putin like better at this point, Trump or Mitch McConnell? I say it's a jump ball. <laughs> wow. But according to the senator, they all might be in the hot tub together. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.